I'm really pleased to be here. And I want to say uh, congratulations to those who were honored today. Congratulations to all of you who are volunteers or who are uh, supporters of this organization. And congratulations to all the archivists who are in the room. Uh, I think it's just wonderful. I had the pleasure of traveling across the country and going to several different archives. And uh, it's much easier now because so much of it now is digitized and you can go through catalogs. Whereas before you just had to read page after page after page, which was very challenging. And, um, and so I'm glad the book took me so long to write because that meant I could find new things. Now let's see where this will go. Yes, it does. So I'm going to emphasize three things about Jim Bridger. One is that he was an explorer, and he was an explorer at a very young age, and I'll talk about that. Two, he was a guide. The, what he learned from his exploration period, then he became a very significant guide in the American West. And I'll point that out too. And third, he was, well, to make a short term of it, a peacekeeper. The long way of saying it is, Jim Bridger had a, a tremendous affinity and wanted to support indigenous peoples. Uh, and I'll talk about that and, and the role he played, uh, not only in, in accepting and living with Native Americans, but uh, actually trying to save their lives and save their land. Um, so th this shows a, uh, a letter, or an excerpt from a letter from Meriwether Lewis in 1804 to 1806. Uh, they went up the Missouri River and all the way to the Pacific and back again. And as they returned back home, Meriwether Lewis wrote to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he says that um, the Missouri and all its branches are, uh, abound more in beaver than any other streams on earth. There was an enormous wealth, uh, the millions and millions of beaver that were you know, scurrying through that, that area west of the Continental Divide, in other words, west of the Rocky Mountains. That was not U.S. territory. Uh, and it was claimed by Great Britain, it was claimed by Russia, it was claimed by uh, Mexico, uh, at the time Spain, um, and obviously the United States. And so that was, a, that was a very important thing, not only the wealth from the beaver furs, but the possession of that land for the United States, and that's one of the things that happened there. When Bridger was eight years old, uh, he and his family went from Richmond, Virginia to uh, the American bottom. How many know of the term American bottom? Okay, well, I'm going to show you a map of the American bottom. So, at the very top, let me see, where's my, is it there? I might have turned it off now. Well, at the very top, you see the Illinois River. Uh, and that's where Alton is, and that's significant because the Illinois River comes down to that area. Um, and what, and the, the Mississippi is the main uh, waterway that you're seeing north to south. The Missouri is where I have that arrow, they just cut it off, but the, the Missouri is, is, was very significant. Um, and, and for Bridger to come out to this land in 1812, he was eight years old, he had the opportunity, if he could roam about, to see something like the Piazza Bird. Uh, which was, there are actually two birds that were painted on the rock ledge overlooking the Mississippi. Marc and Juliet saw that image in 1673. And here we are in 1812, uh, and Bridger probably saw it about that time too. Or he might have seen the great mounds of Cahokia. And there were mounds, of course, in the St. Louis region also. This is right across from St. Louis. Um, and this, what's unique about this is, is uh, as they made this journey in 1812, that was the War of 1812, our second war with Great Britain. And we, they were, we were not only concerned about, Americans were not only concerned about the British, but they were more concerned about Native peoples who were so upset that American settlers had taken their lands. And the Bridgers were quite, quite concerned about that, whether they were going to be killed uh, by, mainly by the Potawatomis. When Jim Bridger was 12 years old, his mother died. 
and then his brother died that same year. And then the next year, his father died. So at 13, he was an orphan, and there was also a sister. We don't know if it was older or younger. We don't even know her name. Uh, so Bridger started working on a ferry boat, probably across the Mississippi. Um, and then he, he apprenticed to, well, the older Bridger books say that he apprenticed to a St. Louis blacksmith. Well, that only tells a, a fraction of the story. He apprenticed to one of the most famous gunsmiths from Illinois. His name was Philip Creamer. And so Bridger was actually working under this man. Um, and you know, Bridger wasn't making guns, but he was keeping the forges going and, the, and uh, working on the anvil and trying to help create things. Um, and so what's unique, and I'm going to read something just so you get a little bit of the style of the book. Um, I write, Bridger and his neighbors had lived in fear of the Potawatomis during the War of 1812. Now the 13-year-old apprentice pumped bellows and helped Creamer make and repair guns and tools for the now peaceful Potawatomis. While Bridger was helping shape iron, his life among the Potawatomis was undoubtedly shaping him to the idea of a peaceful coexistence with indigenous peoples. This is what I think is part of one of the most uh, significant one ads in American history. This was uh, William and Ashley and Andrew Henry. To enterprising young men, Richard couldn't even read this. Richard could not read or write. He was 17 years old in February of 2000, or 1822. Uh, but he was definitely uh, interested. You know, he, he could look north up the Mississippi River uh, and see maybe I'll go up towards Fort Snelling, or he, he could look south uh, to the, uh, the New Orleans area and beyond. But he wanted to follow the chocolate snake of a river that some people called the Missouri, and, and that's what he indeed did. Uh, so he was one of the very first who came up, went up west in the Ashley Henry grouping. And they traveled by keelboat. Now, the, the one at the bottom of the, of the picture is not a keelboat, that's a flatboat. But the other two are keelboats. And they could be pushed by people with poles, who would push those poles to the bottom of the river, or by a sail, or even pulled by a rope called a cordel. And we have it from James White, who left some records at the uh, Missouri Historical Society, uh, that Jim Bridger was one of those who was working on the boats themselves. He was not part of the land party, he was part of the boat party. And that's significant. This is an image, and the other images you've seen, many of them are by, from Alfred Jacob Miller, and this is called Trapping Beaver. That's what they were up to doing. Um, and the scenario was that instead of being getting wages for once a month, they were getting paid for every time they brought in a beaver pelt. Uh, and they would get half of the value, and that might be a dollar for Bridger, or a dollar and a half, or maybe even two dollars, depending on the, on the size and the weight. Uh, so that's a, it was a significant way to make money, and it was a unique way that they were going to actually compensate those trappers who were doing this. So if, if I have the numbers correctly, and I don't, I think I've got some, maybe repeat, but um, number one shows the uh, Fort Henry. So they, they went up the Missouri River, and they intended to go further, but the Assiniboan uh, actually stole many of their horses. So they didn't have horses to continue uh, you know, across land, so they actually built a fort right there at where it says number one. Um, number two was a, a, a journey the following year, 1823, William Ashley came up and was attacked. He and his men were attacked by the Arikara Indians. And uh, that made a huge change in American history because Lewis and Clark and Ashley and Henry and Bridger, Mike Fink, uh, they all went along the Missouri River, but it was soon to become known as the Bloody Missouri. There was so much battling along there, whether they were actually on the river itself or they were further up the Muscle Shell or the Yellowstone. So they started going overland, and you see a, a red line. I don't know if this is probably working or not, but that's all right. Uh, you see a red dotted line, and, that, and that's part of the overland route to try and get, not what you call the overland today, but it was a, a land route to get to what they thought was going to be very significant. Um, and it was. They, they uh, started to visit with the Crows, uh, the Absaroka. Um, and the, the Crows told them, no, th this is not where the mountains are. And they refashioned uh, the, the piles of sand and said, 
this is what the mountains look like. And if you go south of these mountains, the Wind River Mountains, you will find a pass, South Pass. And so that's marked as number three, and that was very significant. That had been actually first used by Euro-Americans, I think it was 1809 or 1810, uh, but it had been forgotten, and now it was used again. And then you see number four, and uh, I'll see whether I can get this. I'm not getting, so I'll just go like this. Bear River starts here, and it goes north, and then it heads west, and then it starts going south. And these trappers were wondering, this is after they crossed the South Pass, well, which way is it going to go next? And they had to, uh, they either said, Bridger, you have to go, or they called for a volunteer and Bridger raised his arm. But he did a solo journey along, on horse, uh, along the Bear River. And he went through Bear Canyon, and he arrived at Great Salt Lake. And what was unique or significant about that was not that he was uh, the first to see the lake. He was the first one to actually, Euro-American, to taste the water and realize that it was made of salt. It was so much impregnated with salt. And that makes it a very significant feature, geographic feature. So they started, I'm going to jump ahead to a, a slide here. Those, all those red triangles, those are places where they had a rendezvous. Now the rendezvous was very significant in the American West. It was also very significant on the Mississippi River. Uh, in the 1780s and 1790s, Peter Pond writes about the rendezvous at Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. And they had huge Voyager canoes that, that came up from New Orleans all the way to Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, went past you know, what was St. Louis at the time. And others came from east and west to, to there. And then traders came, or people or buyers, they came from uh, Montreal and Quebec. And so these were in the 17... 80s and 90s, these were grand trading fairs. And what started again in 19, 1825 all the way to 1840 were these rendezvous that were held in the Rocky Mountains. And almost all of them were in the Wyoming or Utah, Idaho region. Um, and they're a very significant way, and a, a, another new innovation. So one of the innovations of these trappers, Bridger was one of them, was the idea that you would go over land instead of the water. And the other was that they would have these rendezvous uh, where there would be great trading. There was no cash exchange back and forth. What the Bridger, what Bridger and others had to sell were called hairy banknotes today by historians. In other words, this pelt is worth $3, $4, $5. For that, I want to buy coffee, sugar. Uh, I want real cloth pants instead of leather pants I've been wearing for a year. Um, I want some ribbon and uh, I want bells maybe to trade to Indian women. Um, so the, oh, this is a, a trade back and forth and there was not money. They, they kept track of money uh, if there was something more or less, but this was a goods for goods is what it was. And it was, it was very significant. I'm going to go back now. Um, so you see there's 1825, it's at the bottom there. Um, that was the first rendezvous. And William Ashley was there, and he actually collected almost $50,000 worth of beaver pelts. Um, it just at that one week, you know, festival of trading. Because the traders came, there was maybe 100, 150 trappers. Uh, there were Shoshone, Crow, Nez Perce, Flathead, eventually. They weren't all coming the very first one. But they all started to gather uh, for those events. Ashley had to get them to uh, to the Yellowstone River, and they reached something called Bad Pass. And I'm going to go back. Number five is where Bad Pass is. It's on the Bighorn River. And it's an area where you go through this, uh, this very narrow chasm or canyon, and the rock walls on either side are hundreds and hundreds of feet high. So, so tight and so high, that when the, as the sun moves over the horizon, they only get sunlight on the bottom of that for maybe a half hour a day, and the rest of it is in shade. Uh, Bridger actually said, I need someone to go through that bad pass, the rapids there, to build a boat and go through and, see, and reconnoiter what it is. Bridger was either told to do it, or he raised his hand he wanted to do it. Uh, by this time now, he's 21. He, he founded uh, Great Salt Lake in 1820. 
uh, when he was 20 years old, excuse me, in 1824. And then now he's, he's uh, 21 years old, and he goes through this treacherous, treacherous rapids, um, which aren't, you really can't see them anymore because it's been dammed. Uh, but it was a, a very brave thing for a 21-year-old to do, and very eager for, Bridger was very eager to do things like that. And that's why I say he was one of, a tremendous explorer. He just went off on his own and loved to find out what, what was on the other side. So this shows a group of uh, men and women. Uh, the men uh, for the trappers would be um, American, English, Irish, German, Spanish, French, Canadian. Uh, on the Native American side, they would be Shoshone, Crow, Flathead or Salish, Nez Perce, um, and, and other, other Native groups. And they would gather uh, to it, it at a rendezvous or at other times. And it was so significant, this lifestyle. I'm going to read to you another little passage from the book. Washington Irving, you've all heard of Washington Irving? Well, Washington Irving wrote about these mountain men. And he wrote about Jim Bridger. And he wrote about others. And he wrote this in the 1830s. A totally different class has now sprung up. The mountaineers. The traders and trappers that scale the vast mountain chains and move from place to place on horseback. They are heedless of hardship, daring of danger, prodigal of the present, and thoughtless of the future. There is, perhaps, no class of men on the face of the earth who lead a life of more continued exertion, peril, and excitement. That's the life of Jim Bridger. And that, that ad we talked about, on the famous one ad, it said, to be, uh, dare to be engaged for one, two, or three years. Uh, well, by this time, Bridger had been there much longer. He'd probably been about almost 10 years uh, without going back. Um, he just continued to stay out in the West. And ultimately, he didn't come back to St. Louis until 1837. So from 1822 to 18, uh, excuse me, 39. So 17 years. He went 17 years, and the way he phrased it is 17 years without tasting bread. He must be a man after my own heart. So he was very, very unique and significant. Orphaned at such an early age, so eager to, you know, to explore and to advance his own self. By the time he was 1830, he was 26 years old, and he was one of five partners of what's known as the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. And that was very significant that he could be that. Um, they had challenges, though. One challenge is uh, the Blackfeet, who were really resistant of any of the Americans hunting beaver in their, in their territory. They didn't mind the Hudson Bay Company, the British, because the British were actually doing more trade and they were providing the rifles, so they didn't need, they weren't going to get rifles from the Americans. Um, and actually, Bridger was uh, hit over the head with his own gun by this man uh, who was known as Eagle Ribs. This is a painting by George Catton. And, and just a few months earlier, George Catton was, did this painting um, and recorded that Eagle Ribs had uh, the scalps of eight different white men, of men that he had killed. And so Bridger got two arrows in the back from that uh, battle uh, in fall of 1832. Um, so, and then there were financial issues uh, in terms of if you're, if you're trapping and trading, that's one thing. If you're providing the supplies, like Sublet and Campbell did, Robert Campbell um, and William Sublet, both from uh, St. Louis area, uh, they could, they're the ones who made the money, more, more so than the trappers. But Bridger was the leader of this, and, and his forte was he knew where the beaver were. He knew the lands. He knew how to cross uh, different streams. He knew how to cross the mountains. There are others like Tom Fitzpatrick who had a, a great knowledge of you know, how to run a company. Uh, and there are three, three others in that partnership. But Bridger's key attribute was he knew the land. He had been there and he, he was eager to go anywhere he could go and learn more. So what about his family life? About 1834, uh, Bridger married a woman named Cora. Uh, she's a flathead or Salish woman. Uh, they had three children, Marianne, 
who unfortunately died. Um, you can see at the at the bottom there, or no, I guess you can't see there. But but she did die. Well, Cora died in 1845. And Marianne died, I think, two years later. Um, his second wife, about 1847, he married Chepeta, which is a, a Ute name meaning white singing bird. She didn't last very long. They, they had one child, Virginia, and uh, Chepeta died um, about two weeks, three weeks after she gave birth. So he married a third time to a Shoshone woman who was named Mary. And uh, in the Shoshone tongue, uh, supposedly, her name was Little Fawn. Uh, and she uh, lived another 11 years after her marriage. All told, Bridger had seven children. They were all of mixed race, uh, you know, white race and, and Native American race. Um, and he, his idea was he wanted to live out in the West his whole life. And he met a lot of people uh, and, and engaged with them. One of them was Insula, uh, who was a flathead, uh, sometimes called Red Feather. Another one was Long Hair. This is kind of interesting. Long Hair was well into his 80s. His hair was almost 10 feet long. He was very old, and it was so long that he actually had to have men carry the hair. When he wanted to walk from one place to the other, they had to, because it was very, very heavy. Uh, and they probably put, you know, things to make it stick together too, and it was extraordinarily heavy. A man named uh, Ma Wo Ma in the 1830s was very significant in the Shoshone uh, people. And then uh, after him, or and somewhat coincidental, was Washakie, who was very, very close friends with Bridger uh, in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. So these are just some of the many, many different indigenous people. And uh, Bridger got along with them. Bridger helped trade with them. Uh, he supported them and he tried to protect them. Robert Campbell uh, from St. Louis was a fellow leader of Bridger. He was a supplier, he was a banker, and he was a friend and advisor. And you'll we'll talk a little bit about the fact that Bridger had to take his family from Wyoming, which today is Wyoming, and bring them to Kansas City. And Campbell was his banker and was help paying the bills from Bridger's account uh, for school and lodging. Another good friend of his was Kit Carson. And Kit Carson was also a fellow leader. He was very brave. He was uh, very, um, how do you say? Well, he was, uh, he, he could be very active. If, if an opportunity came, he would simply leap to it, sometimes without thinking. And so in 1838, here's a significant difference between Jim Bridger and Kit Carson. The, Bridger is leading a troop of about 100 men and, and women, their wives, and some children. And they come across, and Kit Carson's one of the group, and they come across the trail of a village, a Blackfeet village in 1838, and they can see from the dead people that are left behind, they are dying of smallpox. Kit Carson says, now's our chance. We can go in and attack this village. And Bridger said, we would no, not do that. Uh, and so it turns out that Bridger and all the men that were working for him, they were forbidden to go. What you're called a free trapper, who's actually just tagging along, but they're not an employer, employee. Uh, there were several of them, Joe Meek, uh, Kit Carson, and others. And they did attack the village. And they tried to kill mainly the men. Uh, but they, and they killed 15 of them. Um, and so that shows a difference between the two. They were good friends, but they, they had this, uh, I wouldn't say it was a, a, a horrible dis dispute, but it was a very significant dispute in terms of, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to attack and kill? Or are you going to avoid them and go around? And that's what Bridger wanted to do. So that's a very significant um, example of how Bridger was supportive of indigenous peoples um, and some of the other trappers, including Carson in this case, were really more revengeful. This is a, one of the great rendezvous. This one is 1837. And I'm going to describe what you're seeing there. And this description was written by the artist Alfred Jacob Miller. The whole plain is dotted with lodges and tents, with groups of Indians surrounding them. In the river near the foreground, Indians are bathing. To the left rises a bluff overlooking the plain where are stationed some braves and Indian women. 
in the midst of them, he means in the, in the front left there, uh, lower left, in the midst of them is Captain Bridger in armor, a famous mountain man. We venture to say that no one has traveled here without seeing or hearing of him. So this is 1837, Bridger uh, would be 33 years old, and he was the most significant of the mountain men at that time roaming the West. Um, I'm going to show you a, a close-up of a different version of that. This is also Jim Bridger. Uh, and there's a man named David Brown, who was a trapper, and he eventually wrote this in the Cincinnati uh, newspaper. William, Stummer, William Stewart, who brought this armor over here and gave it to Jim Bridger uh, as a tribute that you are the leader of, of these grand knights of the round table of the West. So William Stewart had a grand banquet, and David Brown writes, on the right of Captain Stewart sat, or rather squatted in oriental fashion, a remarkable man. Jim Bridger generally didn't sit on chairs. He sat on rocks, he sat on, um, you know, if there's a fence, he might sit on that. He rarely sat on a chair, even, even in his very last years. Jim Bridger had an absolute understanding of the Indian character, Miller writes. His bravery was, un or Brown writes, his bravery was unquestionable, his horsemanship equally so, as was his skill with a, with a rifle. Here's what he looked like. He was tall, muscular, without an ounce of superfluous flesh, his cheekbones were high, his nose hooked or aquiline, the expression of his eye mild and thoughtful. So that's a little bit of what he looked like. And you saw a picture at the front of the book, uh, and there's another picture in the book too. This is Fort William, which was built in 1834, and this painting was done based on what it looked like in 1837. Uh, and it was significant. Um, go ahead and show you the interior of it also. But it was also used for many, many years, and it was rebuilt in 1849, and it was, became a very important place for Bridger and many other traders and trappers uh, for army uh, and for Indians to come and live nearby. And there were so many native peoples who were feeling that their lands were being invaded by all the people on the Oregon Trail, the California Trail. Uh, Thomas Fitzpatrick, one of Bridger's best friends, said he wanted to actually bring eight or nine, I can't remember the exact number, different indigenous people, different tribes to come together, the Plains Indians, and the US government would reimburse the Indians for all this white traffic traveling through, the white people. But they would have to provide that they're gonna stop having war with each other, and they're gonna have to stop having war against the whites. So it was a very, uh, very unique gathering, thousands and thousands. Father DeSmet was there, and he said it was the it was the greatest, um, what do you call it? Uh, the greatest decimation of the canine race. And what he's talking about is that, that the, uh, the, the native peoples, they would bring along dogs, and if they weren't able to actually get buffalo or, or other meat, they would actually just boil their dogs and that became their meals. And DeSmet talks about that at this very, it started to be at Fort Laramie, but there were so many people and they exhausted all the grass they had to move to a place called Horse Creek. Now, I don't mean Horse Creek over by Pinedale, it's Horse Creek near Fort Laramie today. So there was a, a writer, uh, B. Gratz Brown, he wrote for the Missouri Republican, and here's what he said about Bridger. Mr. James Bridger, the owner and founder of Bridger's Fort, is a perfect original, not an educated man, but seems to have an intuitive knowledge of the topography of the country, the courses of streams, and the direction across the mountains. The trappers would always appeal to Bridger, who would throw his gun over his shoulder, carelessly, survey the country, and then strike out on the course and never fail to reach the place. I think he did fail a few times, but generally he did not. But he was known for just being so remarkable. He built his own fort, uh, Fort Bridger, in 1841, and it was actually on the Green River near the Big Sandy. Uh, in 1842, uh, or early 43, he built one where Fort Bridger now is in the southeast, southwest corner of Wyoming, uh, but high on a ledge. And then by the summer of 1843, he built Fort Bridger that lasted for many years. For him, he was there for, you know, 10 years from 43 to 53, that particular, the third Fort Bridger. He and Louis Vasquez, his partner. Uh, that's a very significant fort along the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. 
He had several trips uh, to the far west. So number one, uh, that was, uh, well actually I'll talk about the earlier parts too. In, uh, catch up to this. In 1839, he took his trip to St. Louis I talked about. Um, in 1841, Hudson Bay and Fort Hall, they were trying to hire him uh, to be a, 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 a fur trapper for the British. No way was Bridger going to do that. In 1841, he went to, to the Pueblo de Los Angeles, in other words, today's Los Angeles. Um, and in 1841, his partner, Henry Frapp, Frame, was killed. Uh, in 1840, Fort Bridger is, is identified there at the number two. In 1844, 1845, he went to, this is the terminology, I'm going to the California. Not I'm going to California, the California is the way he phrased it. Um, and in 1846, uh, he told the Donners that they better be careful if they're gonna cross the, the vast desert of the Great Basin. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's so many of them and I repeated some of those numbers there, so I apologize, but, but that's actually up number four, is that the Donner Party's not a number three. Along comes Brigham Young. Uh, Brigham Young and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had been uh, really mistreated by many, many different uh, groups of people in the United States. They wanted to get away from the United States, and so they went to Salt Lake City, Salt, uh, Salt Lake area, and established Salt Lake City. Within two years, Brigham Young wrote and told his people, I think old Bridger is death on us. And if Bridger knew that someone was coming to warn us that 4,000 Indians were going to slaughter them, Bridger would probably cut the throat of the one who was going to warn the Mormons. There was no justification written anyway or known about why he said that, but that's what he, what he did say. And my suspicion is he said it because he wanted to be uh, he needed an enemy. Sometimes a, a strong leader needs an enemy, and Brigham Young chose Jim Bridger. Jim Bridger was, uh, was the opposite of uh, Brigham Young's force. And, you know. So by 1853, uh, Brigham Young and several others uh, actually brought a, uh, or a judge actually put a writ out for his arrest, uh, and the charge was treason against the United States of America. You can imagine what the penalty would be for treason against the United States of America. So Bridger actually had to leave his, his fort at Fort Bridger, and uh, he went to um, Kansas City area, Westport at the time. Um, and then in 1855, Bridger and Vasquez, they sold the fort. They really had no other choice. And that was a challenge for Bridger because he wanted to stay in the West. Uh, his wives, various ones, um, they wanted to be in the West. The children wanted to be in the West among their people. Uh, and, and he probably could have found another place, but he just felt it was easier to go to Kansas City and close to the Santa Fe Trail, and that's what he did. And I'm not gonna go through all this, uh, but this, you can just see the tremendous number of important um, expeditions, mapping episodes, that Bridger actually was the chief guide and chief scout for that. And one of them, at the very bottom, William Collins. And William Collins was a, a lieutenant in the, uh, in the U.S. Army. His son, 17-year-old Casper, wrote a letter to his mom. And he was amazed to say, he wrote to his mom that Bridger cooked a whole jackrabbit and an 18-inch trout on sticks over the fire. And then he ate them both, <laughs> washing his meal down with a quart of black coffee. So Casper said, Casper Collins, which by the way, Casper Wyoming is named for, Casper Collins said, was so doubtful that he could eat that much. Uh, but it is true that uh, Bridger said he could eat a whole side of ribs on a buffalo at one sitting. Hudson Bay, did one of the standard uh, uh, approaches for them was that they were, were given 12 pounds of buffalo meat every day. And that was it. You didn't have veggies or anything else like that. So, this is the last segment I'm going to talk about. Bridger's efforts in the 1860s to try and save the land of the Sioux or Lakota, 
the Arapaho, and the Cheyenne. Uh, it starts with him blazing the Bridger Trail, which is safer in 1864 than the Bozeman Trail. And I'll show you a picture of that. And then he guided E. Patrick O'Connor, General O'Connor, General O'Connor, who uh, basically went on the Bozeman Trail and Bridger was his guide. And then he guided Henry Carrington to build forts on the Bozeman Trail in 1866. And then he guided Nathaniel King, uh, Kinney, to Fort C.F. Smith in 1866 and there in seven. And then he guided uh, Morrow to actually take those forts down. Uh, so Bridger desperately wanted to stay on the west side. I'll get the map up. On the west side, and it's in red, um, of the Bighorn Mountains. And Bozeman wanted to be on the east side of the Bighorn Mountains. And the west side was Crow Land. Land where the Absaroka left lived, uh, and it, the Bridger Trail was much more popular in 1864. But the U.S. Army and politicians wanted to make the most expedient route on the Bozeman Trail, uh, partially because they needed the gold that had been found in Virginia City and other areas in what's now Montana. Uh, so that was a very significant divide between Bridger versus Bozeman, between um, many people who were sympathetic to Native peoples versus others who were not. So here's a picture of Red Cloud. Red Cloud was the one who, who was kind of one of the most, the strongest leaders of all the people who were opposing this Bozeman Trail. And there was a group of, of Sioux who stopped miners on the Bozeman Trail. And the Sioux said, you would be safer. We will not attack you if you take the blanket road. Now what on earth is the blanket road? Well, the Crows knew Bridger from way back in the 1830s, uh, even 1820s. And they called him Cassipi, which is a Crow word for the blanket chief, because when he came to trade, he would have blankets for them and other things. So here you have the Sioux saying, take the blanket road. In other words, take Bridger, Bridger Trail. Here's the kind of thing that, that Patrick O'Connor, Patrick Connor did. He did the hanging of the chiefs. Uh, there was a, a, a Cheyenne who was called Big Crow, but it was a, a Cheyenne nationality. And his rule, his um, order was that they hang him from the place where a soldier had recently been killed near Fort Laramie and leave his body there to decay until the limbs fell off. And uh, one person under, um, under O'Connor was Moonlight, and he did the same thing for Two-Face and Blackfoot, and those were Oglala Sioux. And Bridger came back from Virginia City, and he saw that, and he was horrified. And he said, this will, this, this will be very terrible for all the whites who want to travel through the Indian lands. Um, but the, the soldiers had a different idea. They were in the middle of the Civil War, and they had this concept that you know, you, you crush the enemy, and they've been doing that north against south, and uh, Bridger had different philosophies. So, Bridger was, uh, and this is by um, Grenville Dodge, she was spare, straight as an arrow, uh, raw-boned, and powerful. But he told Dodge, General Dodge, that the, the, what the way the army was fighting the Indians was just absurd. And he said, what you really need to do is have experienced frontiersmen, like himself. He called them dodgers. You need dodgers who could just follow the Indians on foot and surprise their villages. What the, what the U.S. Army was doing is they were sending out hundreds and hundreds of men, and then they were sending out these long caravans to bring corn out for the horses, and it took months to get all that out there, whereas Bridger and his men, they could have raced on you know, very quickly. Um, and then he had this quote at the end, if the men can have some sense in dealing with these Indians, they can keep their lives. Uh, so as it turns out, there was significant challenge. The, the bottom fort there is called Fort Reno. Originally it was named after Fort, Con Fort uh, Connor. And then the next one was Phil Kearney, and the next one was Fort C.F. Smith. And I'm gonna close uh, well, I'll say something about C.F. Smith. Uh, Fetterman and his men were slaughtered in December 21st of 1866. And uh, they say there was 80 men. Some say there were 94 men. The Lakota say this is 100 in the hand. And if you want to know what that is, I'll tell you in question time. 
uh, Bridger was by that time was at Fort C.F. Smith, and the Shoshone actually gathered nine different groups of Indians to attack Fort C.F. Smith. But the Crows were there, and the Crows liked Bridger, and they would not allow Bridger to be in danger, and so the Sioux plan just failed. So the whole episode was one of the first uh, wars that the American <laughs> army had lost. They actually surrendered to Red Cloud and others, and they got the forts out of here. And one soldier summed it up pretty well. He said, Jim Bridger was with us all the summer of 1866, up until late in the fall. If Colonel Carrington and the officers had followed the advice of Bridger, I do not think there would have been nearly as many of our men killed. Bridger told the officers not to follow the Indians and to send more men on escort duty, but they thought he was old and didn't know anything about Indian warfare. <laughs> Which I have to laugh about that song. So that's a very brief summation of one of the most significant frontiersmen and guides and advocate for indigenous peoples in American history. And that's why he was one of the people who was actually nominated for, was the first group of people to, to be put on Mount Rushmore. Bridger, Lewis and Clark, Fremont, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody. Uh, then they decided to go with presidents instead, which is fine. But it just shows how significant he was in the, in the 1920s, how important he was. And my goal, and now your goal, is to tell people about this tremendous man, Jim Bridger. <laughs> so we have time for some questions. Yes? So how did he die? He died in 1881. He was 77 years old. Um, he retired at uh, age 64. He was getting feeble. He was still a pretty good shot, but his eyesight was going bad. He had been thrown by a mule. I'm, I'm pretty soon telling you more than, than just his death. Um, when he was maybe 62, he was thrown off a mule and he had a, a, a restriction and uh, that was painful for the rest of his life. Um, his, he was losing his vision. Um, and so he went back to, uh, to the Kansas City area, uh, Westport, and he would, uh, he would love to sit on a rock, he'd love to sit on a fence. He would love, actually, once he started to lose his, his eyesight, he would say, Ginny, that's Virginia. Uh, she was uh, the, the middle child of the seven children that were born to him. Um, I want to go ride. So he would get his favorite horse and get on it. And the dog went with him and they went off. And he said he would, he would love to go and feel what was growing. And was very proud.